So what was the Council in Heaven, and did we really exist before we were born? This is something of a loaded subject, so I'm just going to back it up a little bit to give it some context. So, long, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, Heavenly Father, or Elohim, existed on his own planet as a mortal man. Throughout his mortal life, he kept all of his Heavenly Father's rules and commandments, and upon death, he was exalted and became a god. At some point, Heavenly Father took for himself a wife, and they became parents to billions and billions of spirit children. These spirit children of Heavenly Father are you and me. The wife of Heavenly Father was known as Heavenly Mother, and honestly, there's not too much known about her. It's speculated that Heavenly Father took for himself other wives as well. In the book of Abraham, chapter 3, God shows Abraham a vision of the council in heaven, a council that he calls between himself and all of his spirit children regarding a plan that he has for exaltation. God stands in the midst of the souls that were gathered, saying that they were to be rulers in an age to come. He then reveals to Abraham that he was indeed one of these spirit children. Heavenly Father begins to relay a plan to his children to become like him. Jesus Christ, with others to help him, would take materials that already existed and organize them into a habitable earth. While a Christian like myself would say that the earth and all of creation was spoken into existence from nothing, Latter-day Saints believe that all of matter, all of these materials, already existed and were simply taken and formed into something else. All the matter that made the earth was already there. It's almost like taking a pile of Legos and making a spaceship or something. Heavenly Father would send all of his billions of spirit children down to this earth to live in mortal bodies. They would be born into their second estate. They would live and they would die. A veil of forgetfulness would be put over all of his spirit children so that they simply wouldn't remember what came before. His desire was to test them to see if they would keep all of his rules, all of his commandments, while no longer being in his presence. And upon death, if they were worthy, they would become exalted. We learn that a savior would be provided for us so that we can overcome sin and death with resurrection. If we place our faith in him, obeying his word and following his example, we would be exalted and become like our heavenly father, receiving a fullness of joy. Now, at this council in heaven, there were two big ideas. It says here in verse 27, And the Lord said, Whom shall I send? And one answered like unto the Son of Man, Here am I, send me. And another answered and said, Here am I, send me. And the Lord said, I will send the first. And the second was angry, and he kept not his first estate. And at that day, many followed after him. So who were these two individuals? Well, the first one, the one like unto the Son of Man, was Jesus Christ. The second one was his spirit brother, Lucifer. And Jesus Christ proposes his plan that he is the savior of the world. Mankind could choose him as their savior, the sacrifice for their sins, and by belief in his name and keeping the Father's will, they could have eternal life. Moses chapter 4 gives a little more detail about the other plan. Lucifer proposed that he could secure all of God's spirit children, making them pass the test. But this would mean dominating their agency or free will to choose or reject God. Other than taking all of their free will or agency away, he also desired the throne. He desired the power of Heavenly Father. It was at that point that he became the Satan, or adversary. At his rebellion, there was war in heaven. And this is what Latter-day Saints believe was pictured in Revelation chapter 12. It was Michael and his angels versus the dragon and his angels. Ultimately, Satan lost and himself and a third of the angels fell down with him to the earth. Like Abraham 3.26 says, those that did not keep their first estate, or pre-existence in heaven, will not share in the glory of those who kept their second estate, earth. Therefore, the spirit children that fell with Lucifer in the fall never got bodies, while the spirit children that sided with Jesus Christ got the privilege of experiencing mortality and got the chance to progress. The fact that we physically exist in the earth right now means that eventually we chose the right side. However... The quality of our lives and the conditions that we're raised in were predetermined by our actions in the premortality. Essentially, it all comes down to how valiant we were in keeping all of Heavenly Father's commands in the preexistence. Joseph Fielding Smith, the church's 10th president who served in the early 1970s, expands upon this in Doctrines of Salvation. Buckle up. He says, and I quote, He loves all men, whether they be white or black. The Lord looks upon his children in mercy and will do for them just the best that he can. Then here, he goes into why people are born different colors. There is a reason why one man is born black and with other disadvantages, while another is born white with great advantages. The reason is that we once had an estate before we came here, and we were obedient, more or less, to the laws that were given to us there. Those who were faithful in all things there received greater blessings here, and those who were not faithful received less. It's kind of weird that he puts being black in the same category as other disadvantages, like being poor. He continues with that in the war in heaven, there were no neutrals. Every single person had to choose a side, Jesus or Lucifer. 
every man had agency there, and men receive rewards here based on their actions there, just as they will receive rewards hereafter for the deeds done in the body. The black person, evidently, is receiving the reward he merits. Now, trust me, I will not accuse Latter-day Saints of being racist. I know they're not racist. But I have to wonder if the words of the prophets are only taken in and accepted as long as they like what they have to say. It seems like Latter-day Saints would reject what Joseph Fielding Smith has to say here. And this is not the only time that this happens. Things like blood atonement are rejected from the teachings of Brigham Young. Anyway, I definitely do not like what he has to say about race here. So let's do some biblical analysis. I think that this creation story is demonstrably inaccurate to what the Bible teaches. Every single aspect of this Council in Heaven story is not found in the Bible. Let me show you. All right, number one, God was once a man. According to the Bible, <laughs> God always existed. He always is and always was. He never had an origin. Psalm 90 verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Hebrews 13 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Revelation 1 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. God always is and always was. Numbers 23 19, God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. God is not a man, he never was a man. Isaiah 55 8 through 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So clearly, God is not likened to a man. His ways were never our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and never were our thoughts. Elohim never had a heavenly father, and he was not an exalted man. So number two, multiple gods. So what does the Bible say about there being multiple gods? Scripture says in Isaiah chapter 45 verse 5, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. Psalm 86 10, for you are great and do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. Isaiah 44 8, is there any God besides me? Or is there any other rock? I know of none. But the question is, aren't there other gods in the Bible? I mean, Gods as in object of worship, sure, there's idols, there's false gods, all the like. But then we get to the word Elohim. The word Elohim in Hebrew is used to refer to both God and angels. It's kind of a blanket term that literally translates to English as God, but it kind of means holy powerful beings. I've said it before in one of my older videos, but this is why the Witch of Endor, when she calls Samuel out from the grave, she says, I see a God coming out of the earth, or I see an Elohim coming out of the earth. It doesn't mean that Samuel was a god. It means that she saw this holy, powerful thing that she used that word Elohim for. My point is, we can't use this blanket term in Hebrew, which in Hebrew it is definitely a blanket term referring to both parties, and then throw away every single other thing that the Bible has to say about God and creation. The biblical narrative always displays God as the creator, the ultimate singular creator of all of creation. In the biblical creation story, God is the only one ever getting the credit. He did not have or need anyone to help him. Nehemiah 9.6 You alone are the Lord, you have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. Genesis 2.4 The Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Psalm 100 verse 3 Know that the Lord, he is God, and it is he who made us, and we are his, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So in this verse, who is the he? Well, it says in the beginning, the Lord, he is God. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. So here we see that things were made through the word, and without him, nothing was made that was made. It was all made through Jesus Christ. We know it's Jesus because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. These verses here are consistent with Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him, the word, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. It was through him and for him. All things were made through Jesus and for Jesus. Number three, Jesus and Lucifer being brothers. Jesus, the word, is the creator God. 
And here I'm going to show you that Lucifer is a created being. I know I've opened this up in a past video, but Ezekiel chapter 28 talks about the creation, pride, and fall of Satan. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. A created being can't be the brother of a creator. Number four, circumstances of your birth. And that is the fact that choices made in the pre-existence affect the circumstances of your life now, such as skin color or wealth or location in the world. I think that all that I want to do here is offer some Bible verses and just let it go. The notion that choices made in the pre-existence affect our circumstances of our birth and our lives now, such as our skin color and our poverty, that sounds closer to Eastern religion than biblical Christianity. Genesis 127, so God created man in his image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. We're all made in God's image, no matter what we look like. Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. God breathes life into man and he becomes a soul at that moment. Adam's soul, therefore, was created the moment that God breathed into him the breath of life. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I think that to say that choices made in the pre-existence affecting your life now, such as your circumstance, your hardship, your poverty, is very against God's creation story. It's also a slap in the face to those just born in poverty, or even those that are poor for the sake of the gospel. I wonder if Paul, being shipwrecked three times, for example, was the result of choices that he made during the pre-existence. People are born different colors because of genetics, and some are born poor, and some are born rich because on earth we have free will. We have free will to do good or free will to do evil. We can choose or reject God, living whatever kind of life we choose for ourselves. God is sovereign, and all things work for the greater glory, but this means allowing free will and allowing sin into the world. So as you can see, the council in heaven is just not an event that you can find in scripture. You can't find a single verse in the Bible proving that the council in heaven took place. I bet my channel on it. The war in heaven was very real and it's pictured in Revelation. However, what Joseph did was he created a story and ascribed it to that event. The war in heaven never had any ties to a council, but it had everything to do with Satan's fight for power, desiring to be like the Most High. If you want to learn more about the devil's desire to be like the Most High and why that was wrong, click the top video. And if you want to learn more about biblical salvation and why that's different than LDS salvation, click the bottom one. Guys, thank you so much for subscribing, liking, and commenting. I really, really appreciate your patience and support. I challenge you all today to read the Bible to see if you can find any biblical support for a council in heaven or pre-mortality. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And before you were born, when you were still in your mother's womb, he knew you. But that's because God knows all things. He knows the future. He knows what will be. He knew exactly who you were and who you would be. He desires that you reach out and get to know him today. God bless.